Juanita, if I'm going to stand over here away from that speaker. All right, you ready to go? Well, it's going to. Oh, I think the person Huh? Are we online? Okay. For those of you that are online, welcome to this service. We've got major sound problems here in the sanctuary, so I hope that you're having a better time than we are. And we are going to start out, would you like to read the scripture tonight? Okay. All right, we'll do this. We, we are going to struggle through and, uh, and along with our prayers, uh, let us also oh mm -hmm. <laughs> is there something we can throw over it <laughs> well not that far back <laughs> well of electronic equipment. All right, if I turn this off, then maybe. Juanita, can you hear anything? Bear with us. Yeah. It, you can hear me? All right, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do it from here because there's microphones up there and I can do that and I can get this off and um, life is gonna be beautiful. That's not, I didn't intend to have an impediment between you and us, but that's the way it's going to be tonight. So, impediment and all. Let's worship God. Oh God, come to our assistance. Oh Lord, to help us. You, oh Lord, are full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and rich in kindness. Let's pray. We praise you, oh Lord, our God ruler of the universe by your word the shadows of evening fall your wisdom opens the gates of morning your understanding orders the changes of times and season your will controls the stars as they travel through the skies you are the creator of both night and day making light recede before darkness and darkness before light you cause day to pass and bring on the night. You are the Lord of hosts. Blessed are you, O Lord, whose word makes evening fall. Amen. Evening prayer is really just composed of a psalm and the scripture and prayer. And so our psalm is 145, and we read that responsibly as the psalms were written. They, they are a kind of word and response. So when we do this, we're not doing violence to the psalms, we're actually using them in the way that they are constructed. So let us use these verses from Psalm 145. I will exalt you, O God, my sovereign, and bless your name forever and ever. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hands, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call on him in the truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. And all flesh will bless his name forever and ever. Our scripture reading for this evening is from the first chapter of the Gospel of John and while it's not a part of our study 
uh, for the evening. It is, uh, Im uh, it, it is important as we understand the whole Gospel of John as that's what this study is about, is to open up the Gospel of John in a way that hopefully we will hear it and remember it. So Mike is going to read for us the so-called prologue to John's Gospel. Yeah, yeah, do so. Now, get, get closer. Come, 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 Mike, here. <laughs> Mike at the mic. Mike at the mic, okay. Our reading is John 1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might, all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believe in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, the law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It's, it is the only Son himself, God, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Let us join in prayer. Merciful God, we praise you that you give strength for every weakness forgiveness for our failures and new beginnings in Jesus Christ. Especially do we thank you for your great love for the whole world, for plants and animals that provide our food, those who support us in times of suffering, for accomplishments that are pleasing to you, expressions of love unexpected, and undeserved. People of God, for what else do we give thanks? Almighty God, you know all needs before we speak our prayers, yet you welcome our concerns for others in Jesus Christ. So especially do we pray for churches here and around the nation who worship virtually Victims of tragedy and disaster, especially the dreaded viruses and diseases that make their way among us. We pray for those who are captive or in prison or in confinement in their homes, those who weep with the grieving. We pray for reconciliation with our enemies. People of God in our hearts, for what else do we pray? Protect your people, O oh God, and keep us safe until the evening of the comes of your new dawn and the establishment of your righteous rule by your Holy Spirit. Stir up within us a longing for the light of your new day and guide us by the life of Jesus Christ, your Son, 
our risen Lord who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord who is our peace give us peace at all times and in every way. Amen. Okay, I think I may have something else. I hope I do to pass out because, yeah, you're going to need it. Now, where the scripture we're going to deal with, if you will share this among yourselves, and we'll let that get out. So, we are talking uh, tonight about the Gospel of John, but I wonder, what is your favorite Gospel? Does anybody care to share? There's four of them. Do you have a favorite gospel? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to tell you, among Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's the four gospels, my favorite gospel is actually probably Luke. And the reason for that is that Luke went into such a, a disciplined and uh, orderly way to uh, construct his gospel uh, using pieces that he had gotten from the other Gospels and interviews. It, he said that's what he was going to do. But a close second for me is the Gospel of John because the Gospel of John uh, has a, uh, it, well, it, it, it has the grace of God that I, I think is just put out among us more than uh, any of the other Gospels. It's, it's certainly where the love of God is known, and hopefully we're going to uh, see this. Now, the Gospel of John is different. Uh, there's no birth, no baptism, no temptations, uh, no Last Supper details, no Gethsemane, no Ascension, no parables. Uh, there are the short memorable sentences that we have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are replaced by long discourses in John. Uh, the synoptic gospel, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, and it's synoptic seen through each other, the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke have most of Jesus' memory in Galilee, and he just makes the occasional uh, trip into uh, Jerusalem. But John has mostly in Jerusalem with occasional trips back to Galilee. And there is an important thing. John has the cleansing of the temple right at the beginning. Uh, the synoptics have it after the Palm Sunday entry into Jerusalem. Uh, we can be say about this that in John the narrative is historically based but the goal of John seems to be persuasion rather than just to chronicle what happened in the life of Jesus. And most believe that the Gospel of John, and there's good evidence for that, was written late, as probably as perhaps as much as 70 years after the resurrection. By this time, Christianity had gone out into all of the Gentile world, 
And perhaps by the time John was written, there were more Gentiles that were espousing, uh, following Jesus, this Christian faith, than there were Jews. Um, therefore, that, um, there were the Greek concepts. And there was a, a heresy called Gnosticism that had arisen and what Gnosticism, it wasn't a heresy to the Greeks, it just was to uh, that these beginning Christians because what Gnosticism said was that there's really two worlds. There's a spiritual world up there and then there is a material world. So what you have up there is spirit, not matter. What you have down here is matter, but there was another thing they couldn't touch each other. Spirit was good, matter was evil. And good could not touch evil. They could not communicate with one another. Well, you see what kind of a problem you would have when we're talking about Jesus, who is human and divine. We talk about Jesus who is filled with the Spirit and yet is walking upon the face of the earth there was a problem then for the Gnostics that these two things couldn't exist in one person. So Jesus had to be all spirit and only appeared to be in flesh, or Jesus was all human in flesh, and the uh, spirit business was uh, probably nonsense. Plato. Uh, had this idea. Plato had the ideal world up there. For Plato, reality was a world of ideas up there. And anything physical, there is a perfect uh, flagon up there, picture if you want to use a more common term, up there. And this is only an imperfect representation of reality. So this is not reality. The idea is reality. Uh, a lot of this has to do with, uh, uh, with Greek thought. So John was written partially to who set out to refute this idea that spirit and matter couldn't exist in one person. They could not exist together. Um, and because if God is spirit, that would mean that God would be removed so far that nobody would ever have any access to God. And yet one of the reasons I say that John is one of my favorite gospels is because it is, talks about how access to God is possible. And even that that's what God uh, had in mind. So John set out to refute what was going on rather than just accommodate itself to the current culture. And I think is something is more precious when we know who produced it. Maybe you've got something in your house and say, well, my granddaddy built this or my good friend did that or, or whatever and it was special because we know who created it. Or uh, a piece of music I've, uh, that in, in going through I've known a couple of music composers and when something like this says, I know this person that, that composed it and it makes it special to me. Well, if we can know who created us and all of this, then it becomes more special to us. So today in evening prayer, we read the uh, prologue to John's gospel. And it starts out, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God and with God. Now, uh, there was a time that uh, uh, in, in my upbringing that evangelicals would say, well, the Word of God, that was, that's the Bible. That's the Word of God. That's what was always up there. But that's not what John is saying. The Word is something that comes from a Greek word called logos, and the word of God is, is, is the logos, is, is the word, is the mind and the essence of God. So don't you see, 
when we read a while ago that the word became flesh that flies in the face of all the ancient Greeks believed, but it means that somehow that God can and has come among us. So the first 14 verses of the Gospel of John are called the mystery of the incarnation. And how does that end up? It says that he gave us power to become children of God, born not of the flesh, but of the spirit. And so we have a special relationship with God as God's children and Christianity among world religions is unique that way. This idea of an actual relationship with God. Now, how does that work? Well, that takes some faith, but it, uh, according to the Gospel of John, it does work. Uh, so John's Gospel begins with this prologue, which is kind of explains the whole book, with the mystery of the incarnation, and then it ends. Actually, it ends in chapter 20, and then it's like somebody went and it, it's completely over and then like the author went back and said, well, there's one thing I forgot I need to add. So it, it, you tack on chapter 21 and uh, then it, it ends again. But here's a quote that I got from uh, somebody who wrote in the last century and is a fairly conservative uh, theologian but here's what he says, when we approach the Gospels as history and biography, we approach them in the wrong spirit altogether. We must read them not primarily as historical information, but as men and women seeking God. Oh, think of all the arguments that you can get. Well, how did Jesus do the miracles and did he do that? What happened? And the thing about it is, like much of the Bible, this is not the intent of the way it was written. It is intended to be a book about God. And it is intended to be a book about what God wants from us. So... The main theme of the Gospel of John is, who is Christ? Which helps answer the question, what is God like? I know that you've heard me say this over and over, but I want us to understand that because if we can just understand that why the human Jesus is not all there is to God, but the way he spoke and what he taught and how he lived is represents the will of God, the essence of God made flesh. Then we can look at him and we can say that is the way that God is in a, as much of it as we can understand and that's what God wants us to be like. And we compare this to some things in history or even the current day and look with people that, that uh, are all that the word is almost sacred, but uh, the very one who is the word, the essence of God. The manifestation of God among us. That they have little interest in what he has to say. And what he taught. And how he lived. So... John comes along, and John is written very much like soap operas. Have you all ever watched soap operas in, in your time? There's daytime soap operas, or when Dallas was on, that was a nighttime soap opera. But you know how a soap opera goes? It, it just seems like I haven't seen many of them because I, I, I get enough pretty fast. But if you look at how a soap opera goes, it is one conversation. 
that leads to another conversation that leads to another conversation. There's not much action. It's all conversation and it plays out in all of its sordid details. Well now this is the method that, the, uh, that John, uh, the, the gospel, John uses. Um, the, it, it is a series of encounters with people and there are conversations that ensue. Now, what's in those conversations? Well, there is a four-fold pattern. It, you, in each and every conversation, in each and every encounter, there is first a, an encounter with people, which is followed in the conversation by a surprise, which is followed by a revelation or an insight, which is followed by redemption or change on the part of the one who encountered Christ. And we're going to see, and so actually the encounters, now I need to tell you, uh, I, I fit this for a five week study, actually there's, there's going to be six, but uh, the last one will be on Easter Sunday morning because the, what kind of an encounter would we have had on Easter Sunday morning? Well, there are those women. And in John, Mary went to the risen tomb and he encounters, you know, she has. So that's the final encounter. Now, really, the first encounters are with the disciples. And this fourfold pattern plays out. And we can go back and maybe uh, look at that. Uh, or you can look at, at that and just figure out how does this pattern, he encounters each disciple there is a surprise, there is an insight, and there is a, a change, and for mostly the change is where they wind up following Christ. But to fit it into the space, we're not going to do that. We're going to start because we had an introduction tonight, and that means we can't follow the whole thing. So what I'm going to do is start out with a familiar story. The encounter that we're talking tonight is between Nicodemus uh, and Jesus. Um, so we talk about Nicodemus tonight, and then we're gonna talk about the woman of Samaria, and then we're gonna talk about the lame man by the pool at uh, Bethsaida, and then we're going to talk about the man born blind, and then we're gonna talk about Mary and Martha. These are the encounters which all will have the same fourfold pattern. And then on Easter Sunday morning, we'll talk about the final encounter at the empty tomb. It should be noted to, to kind of set up, because sometimes you've got to have some motivation. What motivated Nicodemus to seek Jesus out. Um, look at your look at your Bible. Say so let's let's talk about the person that is in involved here, and let's just read uh, the first paragraph of chapter three together. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, who came to Jesus by night and said to him. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, but no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Now, what caused Nicodemus to do that? Well, you need to go back into the second chapter uh, of John, and by the way, we're going we're gonna to read that in, in, in the next few weeks because it's going to come up in the Gospels. But... Jesus cleansed the temple. Remember we said that Jesus, uh, the, it, it, early in the Gospel of John, Jesus cleanses the temple. Well, that was a rather audacious thing he did. I mean, he may have confined his anger to the court of the Gentiles. There were several courts, court of the Gentiles, court of the Jews, and then it, where it, got, it got more holy the closer you got to the altar. But... Uh, 
when he went in and did that rather audacious act which nobody had ever done before and he was angry I think that was the motivation for Nicodemus to seek him out why would anybody do that what upset him so and so our first encounter so the encounter the person was Nicodemus there's two things we know about Nicodemus that we just read what do we know about Nicodemus pharisee. he was a Pharisee and the other thing he was a leader of the Jews now the Pharisee was was one but but Nicodemus apparently was well placed you know you could be a Pharisee without uh, being in, in a particular position of leadership uh, and Nicodemus came by night why do you suppose he did that I think so I mean after all if this guy is playing with fire messing around with the temple <laughs> and if you're going to go talk to him that maybe you don't want any of your kindred Pharisees to know what you're up to and I think on a very practical level, there could also be a, another reason that if he went by night that most of the distractions, the distracting people would have been at home. And so he could have a, a little private time. So the, the, the fourfold pattern begins. We have an encounter. This encounter is with Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. All right, let's go to the second paragraph and read that together. Jesus answered him, Very tell, surely I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? No one can, can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? So this is the word, well, the, in the New Revised Standard, we've got uh, you must be born from above, but this is where the word you must be born again. Uh, you must be born over well, what is, when Jesus said that, then what's the surprise? Well, Nicodemus, what did he do? He was a good Pharisee. He was a good fundamentalist. He took it literally. Literally. Can a person go back into the mother's womb and be born again? There's kind of a crude literalism. And I think this is a word to us about dealing with scripture. Because uh, people, you know, they won't say, well, I, I don't need any outside help. I don't need anything else. I'll just take my favorite translation. And I'll open up and whatever I find there without any other knowledge or any other study that the Spirit is going to tell me exactly uh, what uh, God is saying there. And the fact is, and what you do is people taking things literally, and, and, and of course we always cherry pick with that, don't we? Um, there's some things that uh, we'll, we'll take uh, absolutely literally, and there are some other things. And what I've noticed, I have a friend uh, who is a preacher in another denomination, but I heard him make the statement recently that he had seen a study 
among evangelicals, and please understand, I'm, I'm not anti-evangelical here, but among a lot of these that where the, the, the hordes are, are, are flocking around, and there is an inordinate teaching from the Old Testament. That seems to be the preferred thing, that God of anger, that God of wrath, that judgmental God. Well, the thing about it is, haven't we said that we can rise no higher than our concept of God? So if we've got a judgmental God, what does that make us? Well, the best we can be is judgmental. If we have a God who is forgiving, and we're going to actually come to that, then the highest we can reach is to be like that God. And where do we see that God? In language that we can understand? We see it in Jesus. Jesus is the word, the essence, the mind of God. And therefore, when we did that study and I know that you remember every word of it when we talked about how we read the Bible. We said that one of the six principles that we talked about, but this one was right in the center and maybe the high watermark, that we read all of the Bible through the life and the teaching of Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. Then we need to read that and say, well, then where is the word of God in these other parts? Well, how does this compare to what Jesus taught, what Jesus commanded, and how Jesus lived? So as Christians, Jesus is the standard. So that you watch that literalism, but of course, uh, Nicodemus was, fair, was a uh, fundamentalist. So he, he was a Pharisee, and... Uh, he uh, 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 that came up with a literal interpretation. And Jesus said, how can you be so learned and not understand what's going on here? Jesus says, you must be born from above. He says in another place, you must be born of the spirit. Because uh, if we go back to the, the prologue, what uh, that he's born not of the flesh or the will of human being, but of the will of God and born of the Spirit of God. And this is why in the Apostles' Creed we say he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so you must be born of the flesh, otherwise you're not going to get here. But you must be born of the Spirit because that's how we connect with God. Because God is a spirit, well, we're going to talk about that in one or two things down when we ever get to the woman of Samaria. We'll be talking about God is a spirit, and those who worship God will worship in spirit and truth. So Jesus says, you must be born from above, and Nicodemus still doesn't get it because he says, how? Well, it's a legitimate question, but um, I think he still had this mind of trying to fit back into the womb, and that's an image I'm not going to pursue uh, too far. But, uh, uh, and uh, the women among us would not uh, want that to be much of an image. So, all right, so uh, we've got that. So we have the surprise or the unexpected development Whatever Nicodemus expected to hear from Jesus, the idea of being born again, and more than that, if you look at the thought of, that was going around, that Gnostic thought that when John was written, this idea that flesh is going to be born of spirit, the flesh and the spirit is going to touch each other, that flies in the face of every heresy that that group wanted to put out. And this is what John is trying to do to say that these do converts, these Gentiles that have come to Jesus so that they understand that what they have been taught, and this is a bitter pill to swallow sometimes, that what we have been taught and what we've always heard 
may be uh, very different. And for those of us that have migrated to uh, this particular denomination from other denominations that we probably have chapter and verse where we can tell how it happens to us. I do, Richard does, I know, you know, I, I don't know what you're back at, but I know that as we've talked that uh, a lot of people have, uh, have said that. So we have an encounter, we have a surprise, now what are we gonna get? We're gonna get a revelation. So let's read chapter, the third paragraph. Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of God. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Well then, the revelation, relationship with God is possible but it comes from a relationship with Christ. And yet, he doesn't walk with us and talk with us and tell us we are his own, not in any, I'm quoting uh, uh, not too favorite uh, him. But uh, anyway, it, uh, but he does not walk physically. It is a spiritual thing, and yet it is just as real. And so, um, the relationship with Christ is accomplished by lifting Christ up. Now, that's an image that comes from the book of Numbers. Do you, does anybody happen to remember the story that had something lifted up and that was going to save the people? Well, remember in the Exodus, and remember that... Uh, uh, the people had run into a bunch of snakes out there in the desert. A lot of them had gotten bitten and they were uh, having a problem. Uh, and, and some of them were at the point of death. And uh, so the thing was, we'll make an image of a serpent and put it on and lift it up. And if they look at it, they will be healed. Well, this is the image. And of course, what is this lifted up image what would Jesus be talking about how was he what was he lifted up on the cross yeah I mean that's what we're, we're doing in Lent we're heading for the cross Jesus is lifted up and that those who see him on the that cross and behold that love of God in full display that is how we find a relationship with God. That's how we're reborn of the Spirit. Because we, in fact, it goes on, uh, which says that whoever believes in him, now what do you suppose believe means there? Well, it means believe enough to act on it. Belief is not just a mental thing, but belief is a matter of will. But belief is also a matter that if we believe that Jesus is the Word of God made flesh, then it's going to change us. And I'm jumping over to number four, but that's, but that's what happens. When we believe that Jesus is the manifestation of God, and if the nature of God is the highest morality that we can reach, then we see in Jesus, in following him, in imitating him, in obeying his commandments, 
in doing what he did in the way that he did, that is how we begin to reflect the nature of God and that is the thing that changes us and by the way that's what being saved is is when we're changed from the worst that we might have been into the best that we could be that is salvation uh, so let's go on oh yes let's do let's go on to the um, to actually the last, there are three paragraphs, but we're going to read on to the end, beginning with verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed on the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil and hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. God, by the way, the revised, New Revised Standard Version and everything, actually there's a footnote in there that says the words of Jesus actually end with verse 15. Verse John 3.16, which is our favorite, is the commentary that uh, the writer John is adding. For God so loved the world. He sums up the whole thing really in, in two verses. Uh, God so loved the world. We've got that memorized, but then he goes on to say, God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Well, Oh, uh, he gives us eternal life. Now, does that mean that we're just going to be in a happy place sometimes after we die? Or is there more to it than that? That's why the translation eternal life is a better translation than everlasting life. Eternal life may have a longevity but it has a quality to it there it means that we can be live that we can believe we don't have to wait for heaven because we can experience a little of heaven here even in the midst of all the stuff that's going off around us and we talked a little bit about that being out in the wilderness last Sunday but we that we are able to experience a quality of life that does not require that all of the circumstances just put themselves in order and everything be peachy keen. So there is a quality of life and that is eternal life, but then here we go, we tack on to that this uh, uh, description this insight about God because well think about the Jews they they believed a lot in judgment and they believed that Gentiles and that's us were only fuel for the fires of hell and uh, and here comes Jesus along saying that God so loved the world but his motivation God is always in to redemption instead of revenge. And when somebody else does us with something that's wrong, oh, don't we love that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It may be limited revenge, but at least revenge is sweet, so we are told. But the fact is that that ain't God. God 
sent the Son, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. So we act at our worst, and rather than God striking us down with a lightning bolt, comes to us and says, I forgive you, and that so that I, you may be changed, and that you can turn from your evil ways and turn from the darkness into the light. So we say that living under judgment comes from preferring darkness. And there's some people today, they have throughout human history, that they seem to prefer darkness. And we think that in, in some of the power trips and some of the things that they do, that we imagine that they have it made. But the fact is, they have to live with themselves. And sometimes living with yourself when you are judgmental and, uh, and mean and vindictive and revenge is your only motive, that isn't God. But if that's what you're living, you're living in darkness and you do not have the quality of eternal life. But if you live in the light, then somehow that thirst for revenge is turned in in the name of love. Yeah, I think of Abraham Lincoln, you know what I'm gonna come up with when Mr. Seward, his Secretary of State says, Mr. Lincoln, I think enemies ought to be destroyed. And he's talking about the South has been defeated. So what are we gonna do with the South? Uh, well, we're just gonna rub their noses in it. And, but Lincoln says, do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends. Power trip's never gonna get it. Revenge is never gonna get it. The only way that it's gonna work, because that's who God is, and that's how God has made the world, is when we are able to turn the thirst for revenge into a quest for redemption. That will take care of our enemies. God operates that way with us and calls us to operate that way with one another. So this is one of the reasons I like the Gospel of John, even if he doesn't tell the stories that I would like to hear. But what he does say is powerful and it's changing and it's a lot more upbeat than anything else that I hear in the clamor of the world around me. How about you? Okay, Tommy? So, I'm asking, this goes back to something you said at the very beginning, and I'm asking this kind of out of curiosity about that Christianity is the only religion that has a relationship with God. So, how did that happen? Why did that happen? I mean, why the Jews do this, but well, I have not said that, Christ, that following Jesus Christ is the only way, is the only people that God loves. I didn't say that in the Gospel of John, certainly didn't say it. And I didn't say that you can have, you know, some kind of experience. But when you think of God as a God of revenge, you know, we talked of the, the, the first com the commandment that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, how do you love something that you are deathly afraid of? It doesn't work on human terms, but it, so it, uh, and it doesn't work in dealing with God. So this relationship allows us to be able to fulfill that commandment to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then the rest of it that Jesus added, oh, by the way, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so this does not mean that we are uh, consigning to uh, eternity of fiery torment everybody that doesn't have our particular theology. What it is saying is that this relationship is a unique characteristic and it's something that we have going for us not that other 
expressions of faith don't have. I mean, they're reaching out for God too, and God loves them too. But they don't, they, they don't experience a relationship in this way because it's only when Jesus is lifted up that we have that relationship. Does that make sense? What I'm saying is, which is more appealing? Love and Jesus is more appealing than... It is, and uh, that's one of the things why uh, our telling the good news, not to mention living it, should be uh, very natural. Because very much very heavy and hard. Mm -hmm. It is. And, I, and how do people live with that? I don't know. I'm, I'm glad that in whatever way that I my life allowed me to live where I could have this relationship. Growing up early in the evangelical churches, uh, I was taught to fear God, and He would love me. If, if I feared Him, He would love me, and then everything would be good. But if I didn't do what my parents said, I was going to burn in hell. And everything was done based on a fear base. Mm -hmm. And that... And yet perfect love casts out fear. That, Bingo. That, yeah. So, fearing God is not to be afraid of. Fearing God is, is the, a, a powerful sense of doing what that God indicates that God wants us to do. Uh, not because we're going to get swept off into the, and go to the bad place, but because we are grateful and the only response we can make is thanksgiving and the only way we can express thanksgiving to God is to try to share and to do for others. This is why that we talk in the, the, you know, that where one of our sixth grade ends of the church is social righteousness because that's, that's, um, that is the natural outgrowth. Okay? All right. Then uh, we almost made it. So, uh, so let's go home. Let's pray as we go. Lord God, we thank you for the revelation that we have. We thank you for the word that we have that is expressed and lived out and is made flesh in Jesus Christ. We pray that we may take this word as a part of it, a part of us, and make us willing and able and eager to live that word out in the life that we live so that Jesus may be lifted up in us and others may be drawn to him. For this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace.